The Global Conservation Corps presents the Rhino Man podcast. I'm John Jerko, your host and one of the directors of Rhino Man the Movie. This podcast series is a way for me to interview top conservationists on the topics of rhinos, the poaching crisis, the importance of rangers, and community engagement. All as a way to create awareness around these issues and to promote the coming release of our documentary film. In this episode, I'm talking with Bibab Talukdar. Bibab has a master's in biology from Guwahati University. He is the Secretary General and CEO of Arnyak, an organization leading a new integrated conservation movement to address topics like ecosystem goods and services, climate change, deforestation, and loss of biodiversity. He is also a member of the Asian Rhino Specialist Group of the IUCN and a member of the National Board of Wildlife under the Government of India. In this conversation, we talk about Bibhab's early days growing up in eastern Himalayas and his inspiration for starting Arnyak as a nature club, which then grew into a large conservation organization. We go into the success story of the greater one-horned rhino. We dive into the many conservation problems Bibhab is tackling in India through Arnyak, and we learn of the importance of connecting with local communities near protected areas. Bibhab has an amazing life story and has accomplished so many things in the conservation space. So without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. Hi, Bebop. Welcome to the show. Really an honor to have you on here. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've heard a lot of great things about you from our mutual friend Rohit. And I've been kind of following some of your work and you've been doing a lot of traveling and just staying extremely busy. So I really appreciate you taking the time. You are welcome. Maybe today we could just start out with, you know, give us a brief overview of what you're up to right now, what you're, what you're doing, what your position is. And then we'll dig into those in more depth a little bit later on, but just to, to give people a little taste of what you've been doing. Well, just to start, you know, with today's deliberations, or I started my you know, first interest on wildlife way back in 1989. And that's the time when I, you know, founded Arainak, which is a NGO based in Guwahati, along with some of my friends. Uh, so Arainak now is almost 33 years old. Mm. We have been working mainly, you know, focusing mainly in the northeastern India because, you know, here the biodiversity, wildlife diversities are quite high. Currently, I am the Secretary General and CEO, Chief Executive Officer of Arayana. And along with, you know, CEO, I also head two divisions in Arayana. Uh, one division is the Rhino Research and Conservation Division. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the Legal and Advocacy Divisions. So these two divisions work very closely because, you know, with regards to rhino, you know, besides research, research the, the conservations, the legal components, you know, to for enforcements are very much essential. Mm -hmm. uh, I also, you know, work with the International Rhino Foundations, uh, uh, partially as the senior advisor for Asian rhinos. I am also the chair of the Asian Rhino Specialist Group of IUC and SSC from 2008. So I have, you know, in the conservation field, I have like three hats, <laughs> but all focus, you know, mainly primarily, you know, the rhino conservation mm. in Asia. Yeah. Yeah. That's really great because, you know, as I was speaking before our, we started the podcast, we've, our film is very focused on rhinos, but it's more the African rhinos. So it'll, it'll be great to kind of dig into the Asian rhinos, especially the one horn, which I got to see back in 2019 in person, right. which was a really amazing experience. But before we get there, Let's kind of go back to the the very beginnings. How did you get connected with conservation? Where were you growing up as a kid? And what were some of those first experiences that got you excited about this? Well, when I was kids, you know, say till class 12, I was in Western Assam, in, you know, which is located in the northeastern part of India. But then, you know, for my bachelor degree, I moved to Guwahati, which is the capital city of Assam, where, you know, you have better education. So in my bachelor degrees, I took, you know, like uh, the biochemistry, so botany, geology, and, and chemistry as my major, you know, as, as a subject. And geology was my major subject. So during that time, you know, there was some, there were some components of wildlife, like golden lingul, pygmy hawk, mm. but you get nothing in the books because nobody has written anything about those species. <laughs> So that's the primary, you know, I think the invitations to me to get interacted with, you know, the forest officials working during those times in the sun. And that's how slowly I got into, you know, this wildlife phobia. 
And <laughs> once I entered, you know, in this wildlife domain, now I find it very difficult to leave it. And I, mm. I, I found it that I have to, you know, take it forward in order to, you know, ensure that the wildlife diversities that we have in Northeast India, you know, can be secured. Yeah. What, what made you want to study biology to begin with and go that direction? Well, that I think you will laugh when I, I would really say the real thing. You know, my father was a professor in physics. So I just basically wanted to get rid of, you know, physics because at least, you know, <laughs> if I take a different subject, it will give me some mental, you know, peace. Mm-hmm. But that has also given me, you know, a challenge. Because had I took, you know, like physics, chemistry, my father would have probably, you know, guided me. But then when I opted mm-hmm. for biology, that means it is me who needs to learn. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that has put me more into, you know, the proactive or applied field of the biology, especially the geology, in my full time in order to learn mm-hmm. you know, in, in this new domain. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're kind of making your own path. <laughs> So I I think I was reading that, you know, uh, there was a certain point where you realized that there was quite a loss of birds in that region. And that this is part of the the reason that you started Aranyak. Can you kind of talk about that from your perspective? Did you actually notice? Do you remember growing up and seeing certain birds that just started disappearing? Or how did how did that realization come about? Well, I think birds are definitely, you know, the first step to get, you know, engage with wildlife conservations because Anywhere we go in Northeast or any any forest, even in the cities, you know, we can get at least 30, 40 species of birds. So those are encouraging, you know. And when I first found that Arayana during that time, there was a bird which is in fact known as the white-winged wood duck. Mm. And, you know, that particular duck was found only in Assam and Arunachal in India. And those were threatened, you know, mainly because of habitat destructions. That is the time when I thought that, you know, probably we should logo using the image of the white wood duck. So white wood mm-hmm. duck had been our logo for a long time, I think till 2015. That is how, you know, we started with securing the, the conservation and protection measures for the white wood duck in Assam. Fortunately, you know, because I also did my PhD on the white wood duck, and also lobbied with the government of Assam. And in 2002, government of Assam has declared white wing wood duck as the state bird of Assam. Mm. Because till 2002, we didn't have any state bird. You know, we had rhino as our state animal, mm-hmm. but not, no state bird till 2002. Yeah. And how did Aranyak kind of come about? I mean, you said it was with some friends. Were you, what was the original goal of it? Or why did you, was it just like a nature club? Was that how it started? And then it grew from there? Yeah, initially it was a nature club. First two years, you know, we used to write Arainak Nature Club. And the name Arainak was given by my professor who taught me, you know, during my bachelor degrees in college. So I basically requested him to give a name which gives a local flavor. Mm. Okay, so Arainak, you know, is a is a Sanskrit word that means, you know, belong to forest. Mm. And that is how, you know, we started Arainak Nature Club. Initially, it was mainly a neighborhood organizations, you know, to create awareness. Uh, we started doing some plantations program, you know, why we need to conserve biodiversity wildlife. But then fortunately, we got a lot of good students, you know, during those times. And we started like birding. And, you know, birding was our initial interest. We got a lot of other people. And then when we started birding, we also started doing like amphibian survey, mm-hmm. you know, the mammal survey. And that's how, you know, slowly it got diversified. That makes sense. But initially it was aimed to be a neighborhood organization. During that time, I also never imagined that Aranok will grow that much. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's grown quite a bit, it seems. Can you talk a little bit about that area you grew up in or, you know, where you guys were doing some of these, this birding and wildlife research early on? Because, you know, for people that haven't been to that area, what's, what's it like? It must be some forests if that's part of the name. I would imagine. <laughs> yes, I think, you know, Guwahati, although it is a, you know, capital city of Assam, it is having a, more than, you know, seven reserve forests, you know, around Guwahati. And Guwahati, you know, surrounded by hills with forests. So it was easier for us, you know, to quickly go to the field. Early morning, we can go to the field and then, you know, doing some birding and then come back and then attend our classes you know, in the universities. Mm. So that advantages were there. We had a big wetland, which is also later on declared as a Ramsar site that is called Deeper Bill. So that was very, you know, close to our university. So we go for birding very early mornings around 4.35. 
by nine we come back and by 10 we attend our classes <laughs> okay so because it is in the nearby areas so i think it was a help you know it helped us a lot along with the other students mm. that is how you know we grow guwahat is a unique city you know we have over 200 species of birds over 44 species of wild mammals including wow. wild elephant and leopards that's really diverse we have also also hula gibbons you know in the vicinity of the greater guwahati that's amazing. Yeah, that's what a way to start your school day off, you know, <laughs> Right. see the sunrise and all that wildlife it really connects you to what you're doing. Do you have any recollection of any experiences early on when you're out there in the field that's, you know, maybe connected you even more to what you were doing and really made you feel like this is the right path for me? Well, there are always, you know, means uh, some confusions at the initial stage including like barding. You know, a lot of people thought, you know, why these people are spending time for barding? You know, they should study. And, uh, but then, you know, sometimes the diversifications are important. And we started to realize that this is something we can continue. And that can also, you know, support probably our future path because our interest lies on that. And we started, you know, moving forward. Mm -hmm. But initially, you know, we were not looking much about like money or project. Initially, our time was mainly to learn. Okay, maybe in our first, you know, week, we could probably identify five species. Later on, slowly, slowly, you know, it has got enhanced. Mm. And with a lot of other students and partners keep coming, we learn from each other. So, you know, that has a cascading effect. This is how, you know, we develop a kind of team of folk, mm. you know, learning from each other. During that time, you know, we were students, we didn't, we don't have that much money. So we buy different books, you know, with, yeah. in consultation with ourselves, you know, so that, you know, we can share, including binoculars or the cameras, you know. So that's also, you know, you know brought people, like-minded people to join hands for a common cause. And that has triggered, you know, some sort of enthusiasm and some sort of eagerness to continue further. Yeah, that's really great. And then what a great way to, to get to know people and connect as well. But from there, I guess, you know, things have developed in a lot of different ways. I don't know which way to go with this, but maybe you can kind of just talk a little bit about how Aranyak has grown over the years, because it seems like it's kind of interesting because education was a big part of the beginnings of it. And now it seems like you're doing a lot of that on a larger scale, the education side and the research side. But maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the steps of how Arnyuk has grown over the years. And it didn't seem like you had a really a plan for that, but it kind of had its own plan, I guess, inside. Well, I think plan was based on the needs during that time. So beside awareness, we were very active during that time on the legal components. You know, we filed a public interest litigations in 1990 to save the habitat of the white-winged wood duck which was found in one of the wildlife sanctuaries, but some fishing leases were given. And as part of the Wildlife Protection Act, fishing lease cannot be given in a wildlife sanctuary. So we filed a PIL, and then we again filed subsequent PIL to you know, stop deforestations in the reserve forest. And then you know, once uh, we got entangled with this legal framework, we realized that a lot of frontline you know, forest staffs are not fully aware of different provisions of Wildlife Protection Act. Mm. So we started doing legal orientation workshops, taking, you know, senior advocates from the Guwahati High Court. We got very good support from some of the lawyers, you know, who has given their time to conduct such workshop. So legal component was one. Awareness was another. The third was like documentations of mm. flora, fauna. Now that's how we started like mammals, birds, amphibians, primates. And once we are, you know, through, we are going through the documentations, we started divisions like AB Fauna Research and Conservation Divisions, Harpeta Fauna Research mm -hmm. and Conservation Divisions, Primate, Gangetic Dolphin. And then we gave you know, people the chance to use the platform and lead. Okay. And then we started doing some you know, applied research because those research are important to help management, you know, mm -hmm. what are needed. And then, you know, around 2005, we realized that we need some more technical expertise and map was one of the crises, you know, scarce things in Assam. You know, most of the maps were hand drawn, no latitude, no, no, you know, no longitude. So hmm. we set up a GIS lab during that time. And the GIS lab has helped a lot, you know, the government agencies, including the researchers, to prepare maps. And then, you know, slowly in 2008, we established a wildlife genetics lab that basically, you know, uh, helping the 
DNA based work for rhinos, tigers, elephants, and now also providing some support on forensic science. Mm -hmm. And those are mainly like research components, awareness. And then as we you know, march forward, we realize that we also need to do something for the people living in the fringe areas of the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. So we started with you know, providing some training for livelihood. So we have a pro, you know, divisions now called conservation and livelihood divisions that work very closely with the fringe villages so that you know, they don't enter the national park to collect you know, the resources. Rather, we help them to provide alter, you know, alternative livelihood options so that you know they can contribute towards conservation and at the same time they can also get economic benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it seems like you know from your humble beginnings you've slowly grown to basically being active in every area of conservation you can think of <laughs> in some ways. I mean al along that path what were some of the biggest surprises for you as you guys were, you know, maybe you were doing the research and you learned something, you were working with communities and you learned something. Is there anything like, what are a couple of the biggest surprises that you had personally as you were doing this work over the years? Uh, well, I think every steps are learning experience, you know, especially working with communities. It differs, you know, because the Salmon Northeast is culturally very diverse. You know, every 50 kilometers, there are different dialects, different culture. Hmm. So, you know, you cannot photocopy a concept that was implementable probably somewhere else. We cannot do it in total in other areas. So that helped us to, you know, re-modify our programs, especially working with communities. We also realized that, you know, to work with communities, we have to go as per their convenient time, not our, our convenient time. Mm. You know, so that's another thing we learned. The third thing we learned that, you know, in certain areas, it is better to work, you know, with the women folks because they are more serious and they know mm. how to, you know, save money in order to, you know, support the families. So those are learning experience, you know, it means district wise or location wise, we have learned based on our groundwork and accordingly, you know, uh, modified. So I think each day is a new day. Even today also is a new day. Tomorrow will be a different day. So we are <laughs> learning, you know, so we are learning, we are modifying, you know, the, the programs when needed. So it is, it is definitely, you know, that there are challenges, but that also gives opportunities to maneuver, you know, in mm -hmm. order to achieve the conservation goal taking people along. Yeah, I mean, it's great that you're not afraid to maneuver because I feel like some people do get stuck in, this is the way we're going to do things and then they're not open to seeing the the challenges that are coming up and finding ways, you know, new ways around them. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, I was reading on the website that, you know, I think a big part of what you're doing is kind of related to the the human cost of environmental destruction so talking about how you kind of approach things from you know seeing what certain destruction of environments how that's impacting people in in some of these communities that live in these areas and how you were able to use all the research and data that you're and put it, packaging that in a way to convince you know it seems like local politicians and different governments to actually take some action and and realize that there's there's a bigger reason outside of just just protecting the biodiversity, which is important, but also this has economic or livelihood impact for local people. Yeah, I think you know, especially destruction of forests that also results into siltations, it also creates new challenges for the farmers to cultivate. Taking those kind of you know scenarios in 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 samples, we try to consolidate in areas where we still have more biodiversity. Mm -hmm. You know, and we make them understand that let us not follow, you know, what was happening probably in far eastern Assam, where we have more destruction of forests. So, you know, with the with regards to the wetland destruction or forest destruction, so there are a lot of you know learning experience we had. Especially forest destructions bring silt, and silt can you know create a lot of issues for culture, for the farmers. So wherever we lost, you know, we didn't try much to restore, but Wherever we still have biodiversity, we work there. We try mm -hmm. to make them understand, citing those examples that, you know, those villagers are now facing problems because they couldn't do much when there was deforestation and all of the things. Similarly, like wetland, you know, in like Guwahati city itself, we had a lot of wetlands earlier. But now, you know, most of the wetlands, you know, are being filled because you know, of the developmental needs. Big buildings are, are there. Now we have mm -hmm. issues like flood. And flood in Guwahati city was unheard in 1980s. 
Okay, so taking this kind of, you know, issues or the scenarios, we are trying to let people understand that, you know, whatever we lost, we have lost, you know, we have lost. But whatever we remain, let us focus that we don't lose it again, you know, in new areas. Mm -hmm. There are a few, you know, we also realize that we cannot save everything. It has to be prioritized. Yeah. So our priority areas are mainly important landscape. So like in Western Assam, we have Manas National Park, which is also a wall heritage site bordering with Bhutan. So we are working in that landscape because if we can protect that landscape, you know, that is also will contribute significantly, you know, towards conservation. Then we have a Kaziranga and Karbi Anglong landscape. Kaziranga is well known for the rhinos, the greater one on rhinos. We have a, you know, close to 65% of the total wall populations in that national mm. park. So we're working there. And then we are also working in Eastern Assam where there are patches of forest, you know, with bordering with Myanmar. Those are, you know, also regarded as, you know, rainforest because it's almost similar to the rainforest and having good biodiversity values. So we are working in the landscape and we are trying to focus to protect those landscape rather than trying to protect every, every forest. Mm -hmm. Every forest are important. But, you know, the time, resources are not possible for us to do everything. It will dilute. So we are focusing, mm. you know, so that we can show, we can assess our impact if we work for a longer duration, you know, where we went wrong, where we went right, and where we, you know, we, we can create more hopes. What are some of the biggest challenges when you're trying to convince people that these places are worth saving? Well, I think people always, you know, most of the people always looks for, you know, speedy economic benefits. And sometimes they also feel that, oh, NGOs are having big money. So, you know, why only spend, you know, a lot of time? You know, they sometimes may also ask, you know, give the money to us and we'll do whatever we want. Mm -hmm. But then slowly we make them understand that we are not rural development agency. We are conservation organizations. We will help you, you know, with your economic activities so that, you know, your economic activities doesn't create any challenges towards conservations. And, you know, we will provide trainings and other things. So we are not a rural development agency. We have a purpose to help you. And, you know, the purpose is to secure the forests and conservations of wetlands or other, other, you know, that kind of thing. So slowly, you know, some people, see, initially, people takes time to accept. So it mm -hmm. is how we act, behave, that also matters a lot. You know, so that I think over the years, we have learned to mingle with the people, getting their faith. And then slowly, you know, through interactions, you know, we try, we try to diversify, uh, you know, with the livelihood options and then also link with some of the government, you know, schemes so that they can get benefited. So it's a, it's, it's not a very quick, you know, success we can see, <laughs> but it's a consistent effort that can give the way forward to achieve the success that we desire. Yeah, that's so great. I mean, the relationship building is so important and that, like you said, takes time. And it also seems that all these different skill sets that you kind of build up through the organization over the years really come in handy. Because I imagine, you know, being able to take it, take all this research and then package it in a way that people can understand and make sense of. Because, you know, if you just look at a bunch of data and you don't know what you're looking at, it's it's hard to use that to make a decision. So it sounds like you guys do a lot of, you know, putting that into an understandable form and communicating that. One thing I want to add here is you see, people by large in Assam are conservation oriented. Mm. You know, there may be always few, you know, bad elements. They may try to kill birds. But as a whole, you know, people are having a conservation, you know, mindset. Culturally also, you know, a lot of cultural or spiritual things support conservation. And that is why, you know, we still have a larger amount of biodiversity still intact. Mm. But as human populations are increasing, there is always conflict, you know, for the space. The same space which animals are using and same space that we now want to use it for our own developmental purpose. So that always creates, you know, a problem. And that is why we thought that we let us prioritize, you know, the development purpose. We may have to sacrifice, but let us not sacrifice Kajiranga National Park. Mm -hmm for developmental purpose. So that way we are working very closely with communities and also with the government. Now we work very you know, closely with the government agencies, you know, because NGO doesn't mean that we have to always go against the government's decision. We can complement, we can supplement, and if we have good relations with the government systems, we can suggest. Some of the suggestions are also accepted. 
Okay, so yeah. we we work, you know, as as a larger partnership so that, you know, we can bring the issues, you know, to the decision makers. And we also realize, you know, the, the challenges that decision makers also, also face because they need to see the overall development of the state, not just, you know, the rhinos or tigers or elephants. So that mm-hmm. is how, you know, we, we are still working. But, you know, I would say it is, it is hopeful. You know, it is not that, you know, things are getting bad or something. Uh, the bad it is because of the human population is increasing, we need space. So now it is more into planning system, you know, how best mm. our planning could be better so that we have a balance. Yeah. I don't know if you can go into any of that planning because it, it does seem like a challenge of, you know, how do you allow populations to grow and have beautiful cities and all this technology, but then balancing that with keeping these wild spaces, you know, intact and thriving. So I don't know if you can go into some of the details of maybe maybe a recent kind of success in the last 10 years or so. Yeah, one thing, like, as I mentioned, like the public interest litigations that we fight, there was historic judgment by the Guwahati High Court that no forest land can be de okay? Mm-hmm. So those are the things we are trying to still insist. And we also, you know, make the people understand that, you know, the forests are there for some purpose. Of course, there are issues with encroachment. Some of these encroachments are having, you know, like the socio-political dimensions. So those issues need to be solved through, you know, consultations. But at least national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, we don't have, you know, much issues with regards to encroachment because, you know, it has goes through a strict process and all the rights and, you know, things of the people are, are settled before it is being declared as a national park. So our focus areas are mainly national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. But at the same mm-hmm. time, we do, you know, also make the people understand about, you know, their role and also play a bridge, you know, especially with the deforestations that are increased human elephant conflict or as a whole human wildlife conflict. That also mm-hmm. brings animosity. That also bring, you know, a conflict between like forest department and the local communities. So we act as a barrier or we act as a bridge you know, to connect to, you know, important components. So those are the things where we are trying to intervene. We are also working with the teachers, you know, we conduct teachers training program. So teachers, mm-hmm. you know, in their villages act as our, you know, connecting link mm-hmm. to, you know, get into the village to, to, to discuss with the villages. Then we also work with the local NGOs, okay, because we also treat them as a partner. You know, we may be little bigger NGOs, but we also value the contributions of all NGOs, whether they are small or big. So we always mm-hmm. have a good, you know, working relationship with the with the NGOs, local NGOs, and complement and supplement their work. So that is how we are we we are marching, you know, in last thirty three years. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much stuff you have going on. To be honest, maybe we could shift a little bit to the rhinos, the Asian rhinos, specifically the the one horn. Maybe for people that don't know, could you give a description of what makes the greater one horn rhino unique and maybe a little history as well because it seems like it was wasn't doing well but now it's coming back in numbers so it's it's a good success story as well yeah i think you know if we see the history during the beginning of 19th century you know whatever literature is there they say that there was about a dozen rhino left in kajiranga national park at the beginning of 19th century so even if not dozen, even three dozen means, you know, it's less than 40 or 50. <laughs> and now, you know, today in 2022, you know, we have in Assam, we have close to 2,800 rhinos. Mm. So I think that's a rhino conservation has been an epitome of conservation movement in Assam. There was no doubt about that. <laughs> and people are very proud about rhinos. Okay. So there are very good affections or, you know, a support for rhino conservation that has also helped in overall conservation of other species. If we see our conservation history, in our conservation history lies with rhinos. Kajiranga was declared as a national park for the rhinos. You know, or other, other such you know, areas like Manas. Now, Manas, of course, one of the oldest tiger reserves in Assam. Mm-hmm. But like Orang National Park, which is, you know, we are having 125 rhinos in 2022. Pobitara is a very small area, 16 square kilometer, we have over 100 rhinos, <laughs> okay? So that rhino conservation has not only ensured the conservation movement, but it has conserved the important grassland areas. Because grasslands otherwise would have been treated as wasteland. 
Mm. Okay, thanks to Rhino that we have been able to, you know, conserve grassland. And those grasslands are giving shelters to many species of, you know, flora, fauna. That is how I feel, you know, that the thanks to rhinos that our conservation measures, protection measures are en- enhanced. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, for Kaziranga and rhino bedding areas, I think the conservation measures in place by the government is one of the best in Asia. Yeah, I think that's always something that's that's interesting, you know, here of these things like rhinos or lions or tigers and saving, protecting that one species usually has the the consequence of protecting a larger habitat, which saves a lot of other species that maybe would have been harder to convince people to save to begin with. So yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. So are, are one-horned rhinos, are they grazers? What's kind of their habitat? I don't know if you could talk a little bit about, okay. you know, what the, maybe what they look like, if you can kind of paint a word picture a little bit for people that, you know, they can Google them, but, you know, what they look like and what their, some of their habitats like as well. Well, the greater one horn rhino, the one horn itself, you know, reflects that it is having one horn. <laughs> it has a very thick skin, like armor. The greater one horn rhino and Javan rhino almost look similar. But mm-hmm. Javan rhino is smaller. I would say about 20-25% smaller than the greater one horn rhino. The greater one horn rhinos are, are primarily grazers. Whereas the other two species found in Asia, you know, Sumatran and Javan rhinos are browser. Mm. Okay, so that's why, you know, our species prefers grassland areas and we are managing grassland. Greater one horn is probably one of the, you know, few species in recent times whose IUCN red list, you know, the category could be downlisted from endangered to vulnerable. Till 2008, the greater one horn rhino was enlisted as endangered. But then in 2008, when the IUCN Red List authorities, the IUCN Rhino Specialist Group, we started evaluating, we realized that you know, the populations and overall conservations are enhancing. And it is no longer an endangered species. It has been downlisted to the vulnerable. Now, this mm. word downlisted are often misunderstood. <laughs> People think downlisted means probably you know, the rhino's future has gone. No. Mm. I think the conservation success lies on how many critically endangered species we can bring down to endangered or vulnerable or near threatened. Mm -hmm. And I think for the greater one horn rhino, thanks to the Indian and Nepal government, you know, who are taking proactive steps to secure, you know, the population and the habitat, the conservation's, you know, overall aim is going in a positive direction. I think our Mm -hmm. next target should be to bring down, you know, it from vulnerable to near threat. And that is how I think we need to look at. But one thing with my, you know, uh, act, active involvement with the rhino conservations, I found, you know, the rhino conservations, especially in, in Asian context, because most of our Asian, you know, protected areas are owned by the government. So government needs to lead. And I think mm. for the greater one horn rhino, both the Indian and Nepal government really took the leadership, you know, by putting the resources, giving priorities, bringing the legal changes, uh, and poaching has been reduced in past few years. If you can see, Nepal has been maintaining almost zero poaching, except one year, probably in between 2020, I think they lost. Assam, you know, we lost about, you know, close to 40 rhinos in 2013. Last year, it was only one. So significant effort from the government has been put. The frontline staff strength has been almost doubled in place like Kajiranga National Park. And wildlife crime has been has now become a forefront of discussions, not only for the forest department, but for the other enforcement agencies too. So this mm-hmm. is a very good thing, both in India and Nepal. So in that way, I think, you know, the greater one horns rhino is going on well. But then, you know, we cannot ignore the threat perspective from the poachers and the wildlife criminals. At any moment, you know, the pressures which is on now in, in African countries may shift here. Our populations mm-hmm. are quite small compared to white rhinos or black rhinos. So we, we anticipate that that kind of, you know, international pressures may come. And that is why I think our governments are also thinking, you know, how best, you know, to enhance the information gathering system. So again, you know, those are the challenges for that, you know, we need to be ever prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting when you kind of look at the history of rhino poaching, how it does seem like it has shifted from different region to different region, depending on probably which 
has the most rhinos or what's the easiest area to, you know, have poach or make crime without as many repercussions. But maybe you could give a little bit more history to that side of things for the one horn rhino. I don't know much about it, but when did things get bad? Was it mostly because of poaching or more habitat loss? And when did, what year were some of these reserves being put in place and conservation efforts starting to really take hold and help bring rhino populations back? Yeah, I think poaching has been an issue for a long time, for the last three, four decades. You know, there were incidences earlier also when, you know, probably three decades ago, when rhino poaching was more than 30, 40, even in Assam. Uh, but then, you know, slowly I have seen, you know, the people are getting aware, the politicians who take decisions are getting aware because people are getting aware. You know, it it, mm. it puts pressure on, on the whole, you know, the government system. And effort has been put on, the poaching has been declined in Assam till 2004, five. you know, we, it has come down to single digit. But as I mentioned, 2013, it suddenly, you know, increased to close mm. to 40. That may be also a reason because that is a time when Nepal was also successful in checking their rhino poaching incidents. So probably, you know, the poachers group were targeting more in, in Assam. Mm. But now we have seen both Nepal and the, you know, the Assam or the Indian governments are taking proactive steps. Uh, last year, if we see, you know, both India and Nepal, they, we lost only one rhinos to poaching. So I mm. think the, the effort has to be there. We cannot be complacent. Now, poaching, since poaching has been reduced, our another, you know, long-term threat is how best we can manage the habitat. Because there are issues with, you know, invasions of plant, alien plant species in grassland mm -hmm. habitat. That has been an issue in Chitwan National Park of Nepal, where we have, you know, close to 700 rhinos. And it has been also an issue in, in other areas in India. So now, you know, the governments are also taking priority step to, you know, deal with the invasive alien plant species so that, you know, we can maintain our grassland habitat up to optimum as our populations are increasing. The size of the national parks has also been enhanced, especially in Assam. Kaziranga original was about close to 430. Now with addition areas, it is coming almost close to, you know, 1,000 square kilometer. Mm. Orang National Park was having 78 square kilometer. Now, government has proposed to add 200 square kilometer of riverine areas. So those extra space will give some, you know, more future for the greater one horn rhino. Nepal has started translocating rhinos, you know, from Chitwan National Park to other areas. In Assam mm -hmm. also, you know, under Indian Rhino Vision 2020, we have started, you know, capturing rhinos from Pobitora and Kajironga and putting it back to Manas National Park. So Rhino Ranch expansions has been a priority now, you know, to secure the future. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the, the involvement of rangers? Because for our film, that's such a big part of our story. And I imagine with uh, a lot of these anti-poaching efforts, rangers have to be a big part of that story as well. Okay. Now, let me first clarify the concept of rangers here. It is quite different from rangers in other countries. Mm -hmm. You know, Generally, the frontline staff in other countries are, treat, are regarded as ranger. Whereas in, in Indian situations, you know, the ranger is almost like a sub-park director. Okay, maybe a park is divided into four, you know, subdivisions. And the ranger, you know, there is one ranger who is in charge of those subdivisions. Mm. But within that, you know, ranger, there may be 400 frontline staff, depending on where he or, you know, she is based. So the concept mm -hmm. of ranger here is a little bit different. You know, the ranger here is almost like sub park director. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I treat this with the other countries, the ranger is just the frontline staff. And as I mentioned, you know, the Kaziranga National Park is having close to, you know, 1,000 to 1,200, you know, frontline staff. Those are, you know, probably the, in other parts, it is called the ranger. Yeah. So staff strength, you know, the frontline staff strength, fortunately, in Assam or India is much better. You know, like in Pobitra, as I said, it's almost like 16 square kilometer. Now it has more area has been added. It is coming to 38 square kilometer, where we have around 160 staff. Okay, so 160 staff means if we just, you know, consider on the 16 square kilometer, there are at least like five to 10, you know, staff per square kilometer mm. areas. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> so I think that the investment that the Indian government has put, you know, because all those salaries are being given by the government. Mm. 
Okay, so that is a huge investment, you know, the governments are making and that I think make a success. Okay, because that is how, you know, the whole governance systems are running. So I think the Rangers here, as I said, the frontline staff are, are having challenges because they work in a very, you know, a challenging conditions. They don't get, you know, leaves as probably the, you know, other peoples may get. So, you know, we also need to, you know, probably, you know, look into their welfare things. Mm -hmm. And of late, you know, the government has are taking steps to provide them, you know, some extra benefits to the frontline staff who are working in wildlife areas, especially in rhino bearing areas in Assam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that always seems like a big, big issue that is being faced everywhere is just, you know, trying to give these rangers better working conditions, better benefits and things like that, because... They are out there for a long extended periods of time in pretty tough areas and between poachers and communities. They, I mean, they have to play so many roles, if these frontline staff. Can you maybe talk a little bit to the side of including communities and, and bringing them in and making them feel more connected and responsible? Because I feel like that usually seems to have a big impact on poaching as well. When people feel like this is our park you know they're gonna they're gonna be the first ones to let you know that someone bad's in the area. <laughs> yeah. See, I think you know means livelihood is an important aspect. Um, you know, sometimes it is main it it may be because of livelihood that they are demising, but sometimes it is because of the criminal mindset that they are demising. So we try to segregate those things. You know, people who mm. are just doing for the sake of livelihood, we start working with them. You know, in smaller group areas. Let me give you an example of Manas National Park because we had a very bad phase there because of socio-political unrest during late 90s to early 2000s. And during that time, the normal patrolling were also hampered. You know, but then, you know, through communities, uh, the work has been, at least information flow was there. And some people later on, you know, who were earlier involved with poaching, they later on realized that, you know, they cannot see the number of animals that they used to see, you know, during their hunting time. So they came forward, they surrendered, you know, their arms and ammunition, and they have started, you know, working as volunteers. So taking, you know, their, you know, presence in a positive note, uh, both NGOs and governments worked together to revive Manas. We lost all the rhinos from Manas during those periods. Hmm. We had about 70 rhinos, you know, during that time. And 2000, there is a political settlement. The whole, you know, things has improved, and that is the time when Assam government, you know, thought that we should put rhinos back. And 2008 onwards, you know, the rhinos were sent, uh, captured, and released in Manas National Park. Now we have almost over 40 rhinos in Manas National Park, and thanks to those communities, they were eager to again accept rhinos and take responsibilities. Okay, and mm -hmm. because of that, you know, although initially there were some poaching incidences, but in the last four or five years in Manas also, there is no poaching incidences reported. So communities are very important, you know, component. And working with them, are although challenging, we had a program there where we put camera traps, mainly for, you know, tiger monitoring. But then it also, we also monitored who are the people who often enters into national park from the villages. Then our education team worked with those people, you know, why you enter, you know, and then started providing them first, you know, the motivations not to go. Second, some livelihood training so that they can earn. Okay, so there's a composite kind of things that we have done there with a you know, grant that we received from IUCN, and it is really helping. So I think the involvement of communities are important, especially in the Indian perspective, because, you know, as I said, they are supportive to conservations. They have issues with livelihood. If we can address their livelihood issues, I think, you know, we can get positive support for conservation. And that is why even the government has now developed eco-development project, you know, to support the communities. So I think whole mm -hmm. concept of, you know, strictly protecting wildlife has changed over the years, both in the government domain and also in the NGO domain. So we are mm -hmm. also now, you know, bring to, to, you know, thinking about the communities, how best we can garner their support. And the governments are also, you know, doing the same. Yeah. Can we shift a little bit to the, the Asian specialist group at the IUCN? Maybe you could talk about how you got involved there and what the goals are there. I'm, I'm guessing they kind of overlap to some degree, but what's, what's kind of the ultimate goal of that group? Well, the group of the specialist groups, you know, of IUCN SSC is to 
you know, uh, work with the range country governments where the species are found, help making, you know, the conservation strategy and action plan, bring members who are qualified, you know, to be a member of the specialist group. Uh, you know, those members, maybe a scientist, maybe a manager, maybe a law enforcement per- persons, maybe a, you know, good uh, person who is a good orator. So it, it, dep- it depends on, you know, what kind of people th- that specialist group needs. So Asian Rhino Specialist Group is also one of the oldest specialist group in, uh, within the IUCN SSC. I was uh, associated with, you know, the Asian Rhino Specialist Group since 1999. Uh, and then 2008, I was, you know, uh, initially appointed as a co-chair for the South Asia. Then unfortunately in Southeast Asia during that time, Nico Van Steyn was the co-chair for Southeast Asia. But then he died because of, you know, some disease. So then I was given the full chairs of the, of the Asian Rhino Specialist Group. And that gave me opportunity to work for the other two species, the Sumatran and Javan Rhino. Mm. So currently we have about 74 members. Those members are, you know, some of them are government officials, some of them are, you know, the professionals who are working in this field, some of them are donors who are supporting specifically for rhino conservation. We basically assess the situations of Asian rhinos. Since 2013, we have started also like the Asian rhino rent state meeting. So 2013, it was in Indonesia. 2019, we did it in India. And this year, in December, we are planning to have in Nepal. So bringing all the RENS countries, you know, to, to share experience and make a way forward. So basically, the group acts as a facilitator. The Asian specialist group, or in that matter, the other specialist group doesn't have a legal entity. Mm. Okay, it is a loose formation of group, you know. So, you know, we take the expert, you know, expertise and give technical inputs, you know, to the governments or the mm. conservation needs. Same like in the African Rhino Specialist Group too. One of the important responsibility of the Asian Rhino Specialist Group is to prepare a document for the status of the Asian Rhino for the CITES. So that is an important aspect that we do. And beside that, you know, the periodic red listing assessment for the mm-hmm. three species of Asian Rhinos. And within the group, we also, you know, have some subgroups. So, you know, some members may be maybe interested to do more on the habitat. So we have a habitat kind of group. So those kind of subgroups are there so that members can interact. And based on their suggestions, we as a group can also give some technical inputs. Mm-hmm. Could you talk a bit about the the Javan and Sumatran rhinos? Because I feel like they're kind of in a situation that might be similar to what the one horn was at one point. And I know there's a lot of efforts. I talked to Barney Long. I'm not sure how familiar you are with him, but I know he's pretty involved with these efforts as well. But maybe from your perspective, give us a little bit of detail on what the situation is and what the efforts are to save them. Well, I think compared to Sumatran rhino, Javan rhino looks more promising because, you know, from 2008 onwards, I keep visiting Indonesia at least three to four times a year till pandemic start. (laughs) You know, I again started going since last month, you know. So I have seen, you know, there are marginal improvement on the status of the Javan rhinos. When initially I started going to Indonesia, population was around 30 to 35. Mm. Now, because of some habitat manipulations work that, you know, the government is, has undertaken in the national park, because Javan rhino is found only in one national park called Ujung Kulon National Park in West Java. And now the population is 74 to 76. The National Park Authority started putting, you know, the camera traps. Some of those camera taps were also you know, sponsored by International Rhino Foundation, WWF, other agencies. So mm-hmm. that has given us some good record, you know. So I think the population of the Javan rhinos are better understood now. So, you know, if it was 30 to 35 in 2008 and 2022, it has come to 74 to 76. At least, you know, there are growth. Mm-hmm. And then there are also casts being recorded on the ground. That means the, the rhinos are breeding. Unfortunately, Sumatran rhinos are in a very difficult position. First, you know, those are isolated populations. They are, I would say, they are a little bit long-ranging animal compared to Javan rhino. And since they are found in the dense forests, you know, it's very difficult to enumerate. I think for the last 15 years or 20 years, you know, we were only, you know, incorporating the guest estimation. Mm-hmm. Okay, whereas in Javan rhino now, we have camera test pictures that can be assessed. 
So 2008-2009, when we had Asian Rhino Specialist Group meeting, we were under impression that there are 300 to 350 rhinos, Sumatran rhinos. But 2013, we realized that there was a Sumatran rhino crisis meeting in Singapore. And then everybody realized that there is no 300 or 350 Sumatran mm -hmm. rhinos left. So then everybody decided, okay, you know, let's, it may be less than 100. And then, you know, the, the figure came down to less than 80. And in between, we lost rhinos from Sabah, Malaysia. And Malaysia Peninsula, Malaysia, of course, there was no record for a long time. So at this moment, the Javan rhinos and Sumatran rhinos are mainly found in Indonesia. And, you know, so the Sumatran rhino populations, although we are saying 80, but who knows, it may be less than 50, less than 40, less than 30, we don't know. Mm. Because enumeration has been a challenge. You know, the recent camera traps also we didn't find much of the Sumatran rhinos, you know, being, being camera trapped. And once they are isolated, they may not mingle also for breeding. Okay, so that is a very challenging situation. And I am, I am, you know, to be very frank, I am very afraid that this is a rhino that may go extinct probably in our lifetime if you know, some time bound actions are not initiated. The government is trying, but I think, you know, we need to speed up. You know, whatever rhinos are probably isolated, we need to track, track them, perhaps capture them and bring to a consolidated area so that there are more rhinos and they can breed, whether naturally or assisted breeding. So I think compared to those three species of Asian rhinos, greater one of rhinos are definitely in a better shape. Javan rhinos I am promising because as I said, you know, they are breeding. Sumatran rhino, rhino, of course, I am a little bit skeptical to be very, you know, with my personal feeling and experience. Mm -hmm. But let us hope that, you know, Sumatran rhino can be also revived. And that is where I think time-bound actions are essential. Time is running out. We have to run mm -hmm. faster because sometimes I feel perhaps the Sumatran rhino has decided itself to go extinct. It <laughs> is we that we need to ensure. And nothing is impossible. If humans, you know, are together and if we want to do something, I think we can do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I went, we kind of went into detail when I was talking to Barney Long and and he was talking about some of the efforts that are, you know, being made to bring them, bring these Sumatran rhinos together. And it's, I mean, it's quite a feat because like, as you said, they seem to be kind of lone ranging in these mountainous jungle forests and, and it's not an easy task to find them and then let alone to bring them all together. But there's still hope. So hopefully we can pull it off. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for Sumatran, I know there was no even carcasses detected, whether natural really? or poaching, in the last at least 15, 20 years. So that means probably, you know, it is untraceable because of the dense forest. So sometimes it also gives an impression that perhaps probably no Sumatran rhinos has died, either naturally or because of poaching. <laughs> but ground situations may be different. Okay, so I think that is why we all realize now that, you know, it is in a dire strait and I think some time-bound, you know, steps are needed basically to bring those isolated populations, you know, to maximize their use to, you know, contribute to us the breeding population. Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to some of the work you're doing at Arnyak, I, I think I was reading that, you know, you've been getting, you've been working directly with some of the families and communities of poachers. So people that are actually poaching and, and working with them. Can you talk a, a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, we had, you know, selected some of those, you know, families based on the consultations with either forest officials or local police, and then started providing them, you know, some other you know, livelihood options. It may be, you know, some one-time contributions so that they can do some cultivations. It may be fisheries, it may be poultry, it may be, you know, animal husbandry. So actually their needs are not that much. But what they need a kind of a consistent income, okay? So in certain areas, we have got some good success because some people are hard worker. Whoever is hardworking, they are prospering. But mm -hmm. some people are with fickle minded, you know, so they are sometimes <laughs> not focusing what they are having. So it, I would say it's a mixed response, but at least, you know, we have invaded into their mindset that, you know, if you are willing to continue to take the good path, you know, there are people, you know, including government schemes can help. Mm -hmm. Especially in Manas area, as I said, you know, a lot of people surrendered and they hope to be a good people. So with them, you know, not only the NGOs like us, there are other NGOs or even the government are now supporting them. Some of them has been also recruited as, you know, temporary forest guard 
you know, to help them protect because they have the expertise, they have the you know, know-how about those telling. Mm-hmm. So I think it is going on, you know, with with some initial uh, interventions. Uh, but then, you know, there are some some poachers who may have surrendered but still have criminal mindset. <laughs> now, there are incidences also and few of them also, you know, went back to poaching. Then I think that, you know, needs to be dealt, you know, from legal perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, but the people who, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if they are just doing for the sake of, you know, a few dollars or few, you know, for immediate money, I think with them it is easier to work. But then again, you know, we have some limitations, you know, like for NGOs, we have limited fund, you know, our project is funded for one year or two years. Nobody gives us funding for 10 years for a rehabilitation program. But that is when we try to connect with the government. That's why we work, you know, very closely with the government system so that we can complement each other. What are your your kind of future outlook, your long-term goals from here? I mean, you've got so many different things going on in connection to, to conservation from, you know, anti-poaching to communities to working with the governments and planning and research. But what's looks like sitting here looking 20, 30 years in the future, what do you hope you guys are doing and accomplishing? Well, I think I would focus on human resource development. We need another set of people like us who can run this for another 30 years or 35 years. Okay, so that is where we are giving, you know, emphasis of late, you know, building the capacity of young people. And we are getting some good young people now, you know, because they need to continue it. Uh, at every every domain, not only in the NGOs, even for frontline staff also, you know, we need to have a proper training facilities. So, you know, shaping human resources to the need of, you know, conservation and protection of wildlife are very crucial. Along with human resources, of course, financial resources are important. But sometimes when we found that, sometimes we have finance, but we don't have good people to work with. Okay, Mm -hmm. so that is where we are putting more emphasis, and especially in Northeast India, where we have a lot of biodiversity, a lot of threatened species which are tradable illegally. You know, we need to make a good human resources where we are putting emphasis. We are also putting emphasis on the increased rate of conviction, you know, we related to wildlife crime. So we have started working with the judiciary officials along with enforcement officials, you know, basically bringing, you know, this kind of illegal crime into their forefront. There are positive results in past few years, you know, the, the government and the judiciary system has declared almost 16, you know, court as the fast track courts in Assam to deal with those things. So I think this is an you know process that would continue, but I would probably focus more on building the next generation conservationists, whether they work for government or the non-government agencies, because that is where I feel you know the future lies to secure the future of the certain species, flora, fauna, biodiversity, as a well. whole. Yeah, absolutely. When someone comes up to you and asks, you know, why is it important to save these wild spaces, these species? And, you know, maybe they say, you know, oh, there's so many species that have gone extinct in the past in the world. Why do these matter? What's what's kind of your response? What's your, you know, what do you feel is the, the purpose of saving these spaces? Well, first is the tradition. Okay. I think in India, despite having almost one billion people, you know, that means every six person in the world is an Indian, if we see the population wise. <laughs> but despite that, we have still, you know, a good amount of wildlife still exists. And it is because of cultural and traditional practice and the feelings. So to, you know, maintain our cultural and traditions, we have to go along with wildlife, with forests. Okay, there are a lot of, you know, spiritual and cultural activities, those are related to the nature and environment. So that is first. Second is, you know, in last hundred years, if we could protect, you know, our threatened species, if not 100%, at least probably 60-70%, we were successful. Why cannot we continue? Third is the ecological balance. You know, especially in Northeast is a very sensitive area, ecologically fragile, you know, areas. So here we need to, you know, conserve our forests, our wetlands for our own survival. And people have started learning that. People here are not poor. Why they are not poor? Because forests or biodiversity is very close by. You know, they can still collect something and eat. Okay, so for larger people who are, you know, poorer people, 
the existence of biodiversity is also related to existence of those communities. Hmm. Okay, so those are the things we are working with. And as I, you know, uh, mentioned earlier, the government is also, you know, equally responsive towards securing, you know, the, the forest or wildlife areas. Those are declared as protected. Of hmm. course, there are sometimes challenges, but I think, you know, uh, the efforts are on. So I think, you know, means uh, India especially should carry the legacy. That despite having, you know, the so much populations, we had earlier been able to conserve our forest and wildlife, and we should continue to go ahead with that concept. We may lose, as I said, you know, as populations are increasing, we may no, need more space, more space. But mm -hmm. at least the representing, you know, habitat, the animals, the landscape, those needs to be conserved. And that is how the protected area network of government of India are, are playing an important role. There are like tiger reserves, there are national parks, wildlife sanctuaries. Those are specifically marked, you know, keeping in view that, you know, those areas will at least be, you know, conserved. Some of the reserve forests may be, you know, sacrificed probably for the developmental purposes, you know, uh, but at least the pristine areas, I think, you know, that is, we need to conserve. So definitely, you know, that is a kind of, a uh, give and take policy, you know, uh, means as a conservationist, I wish to conserve everything. But <laughs> as, as a sensible person, I also realize it is not possible. So, you know, priority has to be a problem. There has to be an issue to deal with the balance. And with the temperature increasing, people have now realized how important it is to conserve forests and wetlands. With the water is getting scarce. People has realized what would happen if they need to buy one liter of you know water at a cost of one dollar or two dollars. So mm -hmm. those realizations will ultimately ensure you know conservation of some of our pristine habitats for future. Yeah, have you noticed a difference when you know maybe some of these local communities, people that haven't been able to to see some of these reserves, when they actually get to go there and experience wildlife for the first time? Have you had that experience? I don't know if that's part of some of your efforts. Yes, absolutely. I think that's the right questions you asked, and I forgot earlier to mention that. We have, you know, some school activities, you know, special targeting with students. Like in rhino bedding areas, around rhino bedding areas, we have a program called Rhino Goes to School. <laughs> so it's not the rhino goes to school. It's the concept, you know, the people, you know, dress with the rhinos and then, you know, interact mm. with, the, with, the, with the students. And then, you know, under that program, we also, you know, organize uh, a nature orientation initiative and we bring those, some of those students for a three days camp that we organize, you know, in collaboration with Kajiranga National Park or other rhino bearing areas. And during that time, they get the opportunity to see rhinos from a close distance. I know the real fact is that, you know, over 90% of the villagers living close to rhino bearing areas have probably never entered the national park. So we are facilitating that with the national park authorities, including the Jeep Safari Associations, and everybody contributes. You know, so that's something we have started for the last 10 or 12 years. It is being, you know, day by day, you know, the number of such activities are increasing. And that has given a wider understanding among students, you know, that how means uh, they're, they're very fortunate, how fortunate they are, that they are living very close to an area for which people from all across the countries are visiting. So that completely changed their mind game. And they now become volunteers during the flood time, you know, mm. to restrict the speed of the vehicles. They come voluntarily to help the national park authorities. <laughs> so these kind of things are, are being incorporated. And I think those will play an important role in days to come. Yeah, that's yeah, very interesting. It's a very similar situation in South Africa where a lot of these young kids have never seen the wildlife that they live so close to. But when you, you see their eyes light up, seeing wildlife for the first time and that connection that it makes, it's, it's a huge impact. And especially if you're trying to increase capacity in the future and bring more people in, I think it's a great way to, to connect to people at a young age. What's a question that you wish people would ask you that you know, maybe I feel like you get a lot of questions like I've asked over the years, but is there something that you're like, I wish people would ask me about this because, you know, there's a certain perspective I have or something that comes to mind? Well, you know, one of the questions is like, you know, the numbers, for example. Now we have probably 
1960s, we have 300 rhinos. Now we have 2,800 in Assam. So how much we envisage? Yes. Now that is a question. You know, that is when we, I basically tell that we have to manage the population. You know, increasing numbers always may not be good. You know, in consonance with whatever in you know, a space we have. So then we need to, you know, manage the populations. That management includes probably, you know, capture and translocating access, you know, population to some other places. You know, mm -hmm. so that is, I think, proactive managements are very essential, you know, for the wildlife conservation and also keeping in harmony. And that also matters to, you know, probably our own population control. And that is a voluntary effort that, you know, no law can, law can actually stop. But I think realization has started. Especially in urban areas, we have seen you know, people don't want uh, big families nowadays. So I think that human population places will also slowly, you know, in years to come, may go down, especially in urban areas. Maybe in rural areas, it's a different issues. Okay. Then shifting of people from rural areas to urban areas. That may also create some space for wildlife to explore in future. Okay, so I can see a different kind of dynamics, you know. So, but within those dynamics, despite challenges, I can see hope. But one thing is sure, you know, as I always mention, that we may not be able to save everything. But even if we can reduce, you know, the destruction level or, you know, things to a great extent, I think then we are actually acting as a human. Mm. What advice would you give someone that is considering? a career in conservation and kind of entering in this, you know, you've been in it for quite a while and you're trying to inspire the next generation. What would you tell them? Well, I always tell, you know, the students and the researchers, especially in Northeast India, that, you know, there are unlimited opportunities to develop a career in this field in Northeast because it's a biodiversity hotspot. If a researcher working, you know, in this field cannot develop a career in this biodiversity hotspot, he or she will develop nowhere else. Okay, so this is unlimited. But then the compromise is unlimited opportunities with regards to, you know, the developing careers in the field of wildlife. But then initially they may not get that much money. So they have to compromise that, whether they need more money initially and less opportunities or more opportunities with less money. Mm -hmm. you know, so choices are for them to decide. And people who are working with us or in that matter for other NGOs in Northeast, I think they have set their mind. And that's why they are working with us. You know, people, some of the people are working with us for almost 25, 30 years. Okay, so I think there are a lot of opportunities to contribute. Besides money, it is something that consoles us that this is something I could do. I tried my best to deliver because mm -hmm. environment, wildlife is important for all of us. Okay, and so this is why, you know, I feel there are a lot of opportunities in this field. And if we see the sustainable developmental goals, you know, for which even, you know, the distributions of funding or money within the government systems are there, at least 10 to 12 sustainable developmental goals are directly related to conservation and preservation of ecosystems and the forest, wildlife, or wetlands. So there are a lot of opportunities. So I would encourage. You know, the students and the researchers need not be from biological science alone. From any mm -hmm. field can explore. There are unlimited opportunities. It is up to them how best they can explore it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm doing it from the filmmaking and podcasting side, so it's, uh, any skill could be applied, really. And how can people follow along with what you're doing, with what Aranyak's doing? What's, what are the best ways to kind of get in touch with you and, and see what's happening? Well, I think nowadays social medias are playing an important role. You know, with one click, we can get to know using the Facebook or Twitter handle or the website. And after that, you know, in every website, we have the email IDs. You know, so second step to go more or in, engage, you know, themselves, they can contact, you know, using the email IDs of the organizations. So I think the information technology has brought the whole world, you know, into a very closer groups. And I think we can use this information technology, you know, first to disseminate information, second to create partnership, third to, you know, ensure that, you know, using those kind of platform or the you know, technologies, uh, we can, we can, we can probably further enhance, you know, the conservation majors. And especially during yeah. pandemic, it is the IT technology <laughs> that keeps going, you know, the Zoom meeting, Google Meet meeting, everything, but things are progressing. 
Yeah. And I'll make sure to put all the links to your website and social media on the, the podcast website as well. And I know you, you keep up to date on Twitter here and there on your adventures and, and things that you're working on. And yeah, I just really appreciate you coming on here. I don't know if there's any final words you want to leave us with. Well, I would suggest, you know, especially with in, in terms of conservation, I think the Africa and Asia has a larger, you know, varieties of wildlife species. At the same time, you know, the Asia and Africa is also growing, you know, from developmental point of view. I think we need to we need to create good leaders, you know, who can take a good balance. And to to make good leaders, we need good information. Okay, and those information needs to percolate in every stream, not only in the biological faculty, you know, domain, so that you know the people can realize taking decisions based on informed knowledge and whatever information are available. I think most of the time bad decisions are taken because of lack of information or knowledge. So I think knowledge is the key. And that is how we need to create in order to decide. But I'm sure, as I mentioned, you know, if the both the Africa and Asia can, you know, save the species, they can still save. There are failures in some countries. There are successes in some countries. I think it is a learning experience for both the countries to learn from each other. Even failure is something to be learned. Why somebody fail? It is not that you know, somebody only needs to learn successes. Even failure needs to be deeply analyzed. Then only we can see you know, the path of success. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Biavab. Thank you. This has been really great conversation and I appreciate all the, the work that you've been doing over the years and these efforts that you've been putting your life into. So really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for listening to the Rhino Man podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you're excited to see the film succeed, please subscribe and review our podcast on Spotify and iTunes. Then follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Rhino Man the Movie. More details about Rhino Man, the social impact campaign, and future screenings are at rhinomanthemovie.org. To learn more about the Global Conservation Corps and their work, visit globalconservationcorps.org. Sign up for the newsletter and follow GCC on all of the social platforms. If you like this podcast, make sure to subscribe and catch up on GCC's Voices of Nature podcast, where Bob Ludke interviews a wide range of people who have dedicated their lives to making a difference in conservation. A special thanks goes out to Simone Wilson for the music for this podcast. He's the brilliant composer for Rhino Man the Movie. Learn more about his work at simonewilsonmusic.com. Until next time, I'm John Jerko, and this is the Rhino Man Podcast. <laughs>